Good day, students. Today, we're going to embark on an exciting journey into the heart of stars, including our very own sun, and discover where their immense energy comes from. It's quite fascinating. You see, all the energy that fuels life on Earth ultimately originates from sunlight. But have you ever wondered where the sun itself gets its energy? Well, stars, like our sun, utilize nuclear reactions that involve changes in atomic nuclei to generate their energy. In the case of our sun, it primarily relies on a process called nuclear fusion. This involves the fusion of hydrogen atoms, forming helium, and as a result, it releases vast amounts of energy. It's like a colossal cosmic power plant. Now, let's dive deeper into the intriguing world of nuclear reactions in stars. Good day, student. Greetings, students. Today, we embark on a cosmic journey delving into the fascinating world of stellar nuclear reactions and element formation. Our adventure begins with the dominant nuclear reaction within stars, where hydrogen fuses together to create helium. This process is the beating heart of most stars throughout their lifetimes. But as stars age, something incredible happens in their cores. Greetings, students. Now, as stars age and their hydrogen fuel is depleted, helium takes center stage. Helium atoms fuse together to create progressively heavier elements. This is a remarkable process, and it occurs under extreme conditions of pressure and temperature within the star's core. These reactions mark the later stages of a star's life. Now, as our cosmic journey takes a dramatic turn when we talk about supernova explosions. These are the spectacular and explosive ends to the lives of a select few stars. When a star goes supernova, it releases an incredible amount of energy and light, often outshining entire galaxies for a brief period. The impact of these explosions on the surrounding celestial bodies is profound. Our cosmic journey... Now, here's a mind-boggling revelation. The nuclear reactions that occur during a supernova explosion are responsible for the existence of all naturally occurring elements heavier than nickel. Yes, you heard that right. These colossal cosmic events play a pivotal role in shaping the elemental composition of the universe, creating elements that are essential to our existence. Now, here's a... In conclusion, our exploration today has shed light on the cosmic chemistry of element formation. We've seen how elements are categorized based on their origin, with some originating from stellar nuclear reactions. Fusion and nucleosynthesis within stars, particularly during supernova events, have far-reaching implications for our understanding of the cosmos. It's a testament to the interconnectedness of the universe and the incredible processes that govern it. In conclusion, Good day, students. Today, we're delving into the intriguing world of radioactivity and its profound impact on science and technology. Our journey begins with an example involving cobalt-60, a radioactive isotope. This is a prime example of a nuclear reaction, where changes in matter originate right within the nucleus of an atom. These changes can lead to the spontaneous emission of radiation, which is what makes a substance radioactive. But why is this important? Well, Radioactivity has far-reaching applications. It helps us understand the mechanisms of chemical reactions, enables us to trace the movement of atoms in biological systems and the environment, and even plays a role in dating historical artifacts. So, fasten your seatbelts as we explore the captivating world of radioactivity and its diverse applications. Good day, student. Good day, students. Today, we're delving into the fascinating realm of nuclear reactions and their pivotal role in electricity generation. Nuclear power plants play a significant part in our world's energy landscape, contributing approximately 15% of the electricity we use globally. However, it's essential to note that the prevalence of nuclear energy varies from one country to another due to various factors. Now, why is nuclear energy such a hot topic of discussion? Well, that brings us to our next point. Good day, students. Now, students, let's talk about the controversy surrounding nuclear energy. It's not just about producing electricity, it's also a topic that stirs up social and political debates. People have genuine concerns about the safety of nuclear reactors. Imagine harnessing the immense power of nuclear reactions. Any mishap could have serious consequences. But that's not the only challenge. 
Disposing of nuclear reactor waste is a complex problem that our society grapples with. So, as we explore the world of nuclear energy, keep these critical issues in mind. Now, students, welcome to our third topic, where we dive deeper into nuclear energy's impact on society. It's not just about electricity, it's about how nuclear power influences our economies, environment, and energy security. We must carefully weigh the benefits and risks of nuclear power to make informed decisions about its usage. So, let's continue our journey into the multifaceted world of nuclear reactions and their significance in our lives. Welcome to our th Your attention, class. We are moving on to our next topic. Today, we will delve into the role of nuclear energy in our broader energy mix. Nuclear power, my dear students, does not operate in isolation. It is a vital part of our diverse energy portfolio. It complements various other energy sources and plays a pivotal role in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Understanding this synergy is crucial as we continue our exploration of nuclear reactions. Your attention, class. Last but not least, let's peer into the future of nuclear energy. There are exciting advancements in nuclear technology on the horizon. These innovations hold the potential to address safety concerns and improve the management of nuclear waste. As we conclude our discussion today, keep an eye on the ever-evolving landscape of nuclear energy. Thank you for joining me on this enlightening journey through the world of nuclear reactions and electricity generation. Last but not... Hello, everyone. Today, we're delving into the fascinating world of nuclear reactions. But before we jump into balanced nuclear equations, we need to understand some essential concepts. Inside the nucleus of an atom, we have two types of particles, protons and neutrons, which we collectively call nucleons. The atomic number tells us how many protons an element has, while the mass number represents the total nucleon count. And remember, atoms with the same atomic number but different mass numbers are called isotopes. These facts are crucial to grasp before we proceed further. Hello, everyone. Now, let's dive into mass numbers and isotopes. The mass number is the total count of protons and neutrons in an atom's nucleus. Here's the interesting part. Atoms of the same element can have different mass numbers, which means they have different numbers of neutrons. We call these variations isotopes. This concept is crucial when we start dealing with nuclear reactions and balanced equations. Now, let's Welcome back, students. Today, we're going to explore a fascinating topic in chemistry, isotopes and mass numbers. Isotopes are essentially different versions of an element, and we distinguish them by their mass numbers. Let's take uranium as an example. There are three naturally occurring isotopes of uranium. Uranium-234, Uranium-235, and Uranium-238. These numerical suffixes represent the mass numbers of the isotopes. You can also write them as 23492U, 23592U, and 23892U, where the superscript indicates the mass number and the subscript is the atomic number. Now, let's delve deeper into the world of isotopes and discover their significance in chemistry. Welcome back, Stu. All right. Let's get into more detail about these uranium isotopes. We have three of them. Uranium-234, Uranium-235, and Uranium-238. Each of these isotopes has a specific mass number and atomic number. For example, Uranium-234 has a mass number of 234 and an atomic number of 92. Similarly, uranium-235 has a mass number of 235 and an atomic number of 92. And lastly, uranium-238 has a mass number of 238 and an atomic number of 92. As you can see, the atomic number remains the same because they all belong to the same element, uranium. The only difference is in their mass numbers, which is what distinguishes these isotopes from one another. Now, Let's explore more about how isotopes are used and their significance in various fields. All right, let's get... As we continue our journey into the world of isotopes, it's crucial to understand their significance. Isotopes possess unique properties owing to their differing mass numbers. 
This uniqueness makes them incredibly valuable in various fields of science and technology. For instance, in nuclear energy, isotopes play a pivotal role. Additionally, in the field of medicine, isotopes are used for diagnostic purposes and even for treating diseases. Some isotopes are radioactive, and they are used for tracing and diagnosing diseases, allowing for precise medical procedures. Moreover, isotopes are instrumental in dating artifacts, helping archaeologists and historians uncover the mysteries of our past. So, remember, isotopes aren't just numbers. They're keys to unlocking the secrets of the universe. Stay curious and eager to learn as our exploration of chemistry continues. As we continue our journey, Good day, students. Today, we're embarking on an exciting journey into the world of nuclides and radionuclides. Let's start with the basics. A nuclide is a term used to describe a nucleus, and what makes a nuclide unique is its specific number of protons and neutrons. But here's where things get really interesting. Some nuclides are radioactive, and we call them radionuclides. Atoms containing these radioactive nuclei are referred to as radioisotopes. So, in essence, we're going to explore the world of these special nuclei that emit radiation. This has profound implications in various fields, from medicine to energy production. As we delve deeper into this topic, remember that the behavior of these radionuclides is governed by the fascinating world of nuclear physics. Now, let's journey further into the intricacies of nuclides and radionuclides. Good day, student. Good day, students. Today, we're delving into the intriguing world of radioactive decay and specifically, a type called alpha decay or alpha emission. When a nucleus spontaneously decomposes, we label it as radioactive decay. This decomposition process involves the emission of an alpha particle. Now, if we take a look at equation 21.1, something fascinating happens. The sum of the mass numbers on both sides of the equation remains the same as in 1238 equals 234 plus 42. Similarly, the sum of the atomic numbers on both sides of the equation is equal, like 192 equals 90 plus 22. This balance of mass and atomic numbers is crucial in all nuclear equations, ensuring the conservation of these fundamental properties. As we continue, you'll understand more about the fascinating world of nuclear reactions and their intricacies. Good day, student. Welcome back, students. Today, we're delving into a fascinating topic, alpha radiation. Now, what exactly is alpha radiation? It's a type of radiation consisting of fer u helium fer nuclei, which we represent as fer u helium or simply, A. These alpha particles are quite remarkable. They have unique properties that set them apart. Let's explore these characteristics in more detail as we continue our journey into the world of radiation and atomic particles. Welcome back, students. Good day, students. Today, we're delving into the fascinating world of beta decay and its connection to the conversion of a neutron into a proton. Beta decay is a nuclear process that involves the emission of a beta particle, which we'll explore in detail. In our example, we observe that the atomic number of the reactant increases from 53 to 54. But what does this mean? Well, it means that a proton was created during this process. In simple terms, beta emission is equivalent to the conversion of a neutron, often denoted as 1on or simply in, into a proton, represented as 11h or simply p. This transformation can be expressed as an right pointing arrow p plus beta, or neutron becomes a proton and emits a beta minus particle. Now, let's dig deeper into the intricacies of beta decay. Good day, students. All right, students, before we go any further, Let's get to know our key player in beta decay, the beta particle. Beta particles are high-energy electrons or positrons that are emitted during this nuclear process. There are two types of beta particles, beta minus, beta, and beta plus, beta plus. Beta minus particles are negatively charged electrons, while beta plus particles are positively charged positrons. Both types play crucial roles in the world of particle physics. Beta particles have relatively small mass compared to protons and neutrons, but their high energy makes them significant participants in nuclear reactions. Now, let's continue our exploration of beta decay. All right, students. Today, we're going to dive deep into the details of beta decay. 
particularly focusing on beta minus decay. As we mentioned earlier, this process involves the conversion of a neutron into a proton, accompanied by the emission of a beta minus particle. Imagine a neutron transforming into a proton, right before our eyes. This conversion is what causes the increase in the atomic number we observed earlier. It's a fantastic example of how fundamental particles interact in the atomic nucleus. In the next topic, we'll explore some real-world applications and implications of beta decay. Today, we're going Today, we've seen how beta decay plays a pivotal role in nuclear physics. But did you know that it also has practical applications in the real world? In this topic, we'll explore some of the key applications of beta decay. One of the most crucial areas is medicine, where radioactive isotopes produced through beta decay are used for both imaging and therapy. Additionally, beta decay has revolutionized the field of archaeology, helping us date ancient artifacts using techniques like carbon-14 dating. Furthermore, understanding beta decay is essential for comprehending stellar nucleosynthesis, the process by which elements are formed in the hearts of stars. So, as you can see, beta decay has far-reaching implications beyond the laboratory. Let's move on to our final topic to wrap up our discussion. Today, we've seen... All right, students, it's time to wrap up our exploration of beta decay. We've journeyed through the process, from understanding how it causes the atomic number to increase by converting a neutron into a proton to discovering its practical applications in medicine, archaeology, and astrophysics. Beta decay is a fundamental concept in nuclear physics, and its effects ripple throughout various scientific disciplines. Remember, the conversion of particles and the release of beta particles play a pivotal role in this process. As you continue your studies, keep in mind the remarkable world of subatomic particles and their impact on our understanding of the universe. Thank you for joining me today, and stay curious about the mysteries of the atomic nucleus. All right, students. Good day, students. Today, we're going to delve into an intriguing aspect of nuclear physics, beta decay. Now, before we dive into the details, let's clear up a common misconception. Just because we observe an electron being emitted from a nucleus during beta decay, it doesn't mean that the nucleus is made up of these particles. It's a bit like a match giving off sparks when struck, the sparks don't make up the match itself. In beta decay, the electron, or beta particle, comes into existence only when the nucleus undergoes a specific type of nuclear reaction. What's even more fascinating is that the speed of this beta particle is quite high, and it doesn't end up in an orbital around the decaying atom. So, today, we'll explore the intricacies of beta decay and the fascinating world of nuclear reactions. Let's get started. Good day, student. Now that we've laid the groundwork, let's delve deeper into the mechanism of electron emission in beta decay. It's important to understand that this process is a result of nuclear reactions happening within the nucleus itself. Unlike regular electrons found in atoms, these beta particles are generated from within the nucleus during specific nuclear reactions. What's truly remarkable is that these beta particles possess significant energy, and this energy plays a crucial role in the decay process. As we proceed, we'll uncover more about the physics behind beta decay, and how it contributes to our understanding of nuclear phenomena. Now that we've laid the ground. All right, students, let's continue our exploration of beta decay and nucleus composition. Remember, it's crucial to differentiate between the nucleus and the beta particles. The nucleus itself is not composed of these particles any more than a match is composed of sparks. Beta decay is a nuclear event that involves specific reactions happening within the nucleus. This analogy with sparks and matches can help us grasp the concept better. We're about to uncover more about the fascinating world of nuclear reactions and beta decay, so stay tuned. All right, students. As we progress in our discussion of beta decay, it's time to address another intriguing aspect, the speed of beta particles and their orbits. Unlike electrons in regular atomic orbits, Beta particles possess significant energy, leading to high speeds. Surprisingly, they don't end up in orbits around the decaying atom, which raises questions about the quantum nature of their behavior. This is where the world of particle physics meets nuclear physics, and we'll unravel more about it in our upcoming lessons. Keep those questions coming, as understanding beta decay is a fascinating journey into the heart of matter. 
As we progress in our Before we wrap up today's lesson, let's recap what we've learned about beta decay. We clarified that just because an electron is emitted in beta decay, it doesn't mean the nucleus is composed of these particles. Instead, beta decay is a result of nuclear reactions happening within the nucleus itself. The beta particles generated possess high energy and don't follow typical atomic orbits, which adds a layer of complexity to their behavior. As we journey deeper into the world of nuclear physics, we'll explore more mysteries and uncover the secrets of the subatomic realm. Stay curious, and see you in our next class. Before we wrap up to As we've seen, the exact value of RBE isn't fixed and can vary based on several factors. This makes radiation biology a complex but crucial field of study. Understanding the relationships between dose, RBE, and effective dosage is vital for ensuring the safety of individuals exposed to radiation. So, remember, when it comes to radiation, knowledge is power, and safety is paramount. Stay curious, and keep learning. As we've seen, the Good day, students. Today, we're delving into a fascinating phenomenon known as electron capture. This process involves the nucleus of an atom capturing an electron from the electron cloud that surrounds it. It's like the nucleus reaching out and grabbing an electron. To help us understand this concept better, let's take a look at an example. The decay of rubidium-81 into krypton-81 through electron capture. This process has a lot to teach us about the inner workings of atoms. Now, let's move forward and explore the intricacies of electron capture in more detail. Good day, student. Now, let's take a closer look at the rubidium-81 decay. Rubidium-81, denoted as 8137RB, undergoes electron capture, resulting in its transformation into krypton-81, represented as 8136 ker. During this process, the electron configuration within the atom changes, leading to the formation of a new element. This transformation has significant implications in the world of nuclear physics. Let's continue our exploration to understand the finer details. Now, let's To comprehend electron capture fully, we must understand the interaction between the electron cloud and the nucleus. The electron cloud is the outer region of an atom where electrons orbit, while the nucleus is the central core containing protons and neutrons. Electron capture takes place when the nucleus exerts a powerful attraction on an electron from the cloud, leading to its capture. This process showcases the intricate dance of particles within an atom. Now, let's delve deeper into the specifics of electron capture and its significance. To comprehend ele why is electron capture significant, you may wonder. Well, electron capture is a vital component of nuclear decay processes. When it occurs, it leads to the transformation of one element into another, which has profound implications in the world of science and nuclear physics. This phenomenon plays a crucial role in understanding isotopes and the behavior of atoms at the atomic level. As we continue our journey into the world of electron capture, keep in mind the transformative power it holds in the realm of nuclear science. Why is electron as we come to the end of our exploration of electron capture, let's summarize what we've learned. Electron capture is the process of the nucleus capturing an electron from the electron cloud surrounding it. We've seen this in action through the example of rubidium-81 decay into KRYPTON-81. This phenomenon holds great importance in the field of nuclear physics and atomic science, shedding light on the inner workings of atoms. Stay curious, my dear students, as we continue our exciting journey into the world of science and discovery. As we come to the Good day, students. Today, we're delving into the intriguing world of electron capture, a fascinating process that plays a significant role in atomic transformations. Electron capture occurs when an electron is consumed in a nuclear reaction. Unlike other reactions where electrons are formed, here, we find electrons on the reactant side of the equation. This process also has a remarkable effect on the nucleus, as it converts a proton into a neutron. Let's explore this further. Good day, student. Now, let's take a closer look at the equation that represents electron capture. It looks like this. 
1 1 p, plus, 0 minus 1 e, yields, 1 o n. Each symbol in this equation has its own meaning. The 1 1 p represents a proton. The 0 minus 1 e represents an electron. And the 1 0 n represents a neutron. This equation helps us visualize how electron capture transforms the atomic structure. Pay attention to the symbols. They hold the key to understanding this process. Now, let's take now, let's dig deeper into the transformation that occurs during electron capture. As I mentioned earlier, electron capture converts a proton into a neutron. This conversion is a pivotal moment in nuclear reactions because it changes the composition of the nucleus. Imagine the impact this has on the stability and behavior of atoms. Let's explore why this conversion is so significant. Now, let's Electron capture isn't just a theoretical concept. It has practical applications in the real world. We'll explore some of these applications, which extend into fields like nuclear physics and chemistry. Understanding electron capture can help us harness its power for various purposes. Let's take a look at some of the exciting real-world uses. Electron capture Before we wrap up our discussion on electron capture, Let's quickly recap the essential points we've covered today. Electron capture is a process where an electron is consumed, resulting in the conversion of a proton into a neutron. This transformation is vital in understanding atomic structure and nuclear reactions. As you continue your studies, remember the significance of electron capture in shaping the world of atoms and nuclei. Thank you for your attention today. Before we wrap... Okay. Folks, predicting whether a nucleus is radioactive and how it might decay isn't a straightforward task. There's no single rule that can do that job for us. However, don't despair. We have empirical observations on our side. These observations, while not absolute, can certainly help us make educated predictions about the stability of a nucleus. As we continue our journey through nuclear stability, we'll uncover some of these observations and their significance. Okay, folks. Good day, students. Today, we're embarking on an exciting journey into the world of nuclear stability and decay. By the end of this section, you'll have the skills to predict nuclear stability and even determine the type of nuclear decay based on a crucial factor, the neutron-to-proton ratio of an isotope. You'll also become proficient in writing balanced nuclear equations for nuclear transmutation. So, let's dive right in. Good day, students. All right. Let's start by understanding what nuclear stability is all about. Nuclear stability refers to the state in which an atomic nucleus is balanced and not prone to spontaneous changes. To grasp this concept, we'll explore the various factors that influence nuclear stability. One of the key factors is the neutron-to-proton ratio, which plays a critical role in determining whether a nucleus is stable or not. Keep that in mind as we move forward. All right, let's now, let's delve into predicting nuclear decay. The neutron-to-proton ratio is like our crystal ball in the world of nuclear physics. It helps us foresee what type of nuclear decay will occur. We'll explore the three primary types of nuclear decay, alpha, beta, and gamma. I'll walk you through some examples to illustrate how we can use this ratio to predict the outcome of nuclear decay reactions. This skill will be invaluable as we progress in our studies. Now. Moving on, let's tackle the art of writing balanced nuclear equations. Just like in chemistry, balanced equations are crucial in nuclear reactions. We'll explore the importance of these equations, and break down the steps to write them accurately. I'll provide you with plenty of practice examples to hone your skills. By the end of this section, you'll be writing balanced nuclear equations like a pro. Moving on. Before we conclude, Let's quickly recap what we've covered today. We explored the fundamentals of nuclear stability, learned how to predict nuclear decay based on the neutron-to-proton ratio, and mastered the art of writing balanced nuclear equations. These are powerful tools in the world of nuclear physics. I encourage you to further explore this fascinating field, and apply your knowledge to understand the mysteries of the atomic nucleus. Keep up the great work, and I can't wait to see you excel in your studies. Before we
Hello, students. Today, we're going to unravel the mysteries of atomic nuclei and the fascinating world of neutron to proton ratios. It might seem perplexing how a large number of positively charged protons can coexist within the confines of the tiny nucleus. After all, like charges repel each other. But fear not, there's an extraordinary force at play here known as the strong nuclear force. This force operates at extremely close distances and acts as a powerful attraction between the nucleons, which include protons and neutrons. Neutrons, in particular, play a crucial role in mediating this attractive force. So, as we delve deeper into this topic, remember that the nucleus is a realm where the laws of physics take on a whole new dimension. Hello, students. Good day, students. Today, we're delving into the fascinating world of isotopes and a concept called the belt of stability. First, let's understand what isotopes are and how they're related to the number of protons and neutrons in an atom. As we can see in figure 21.1, all known isotopes are plotted based on their protons and neutrons. But here's the interesting part. Notice how the plot goes above the line for a 1 to 1 neutron to proton ratio for heavier elements. What does this mean? Let's find out. Good day, student. Now, let's focus on something called the belt of stability. In figure 21.1, you'll see dark blue dots. These dots represent stable isotopes. What does stable mean in this context? We'll get to that in a moment. But what's important to note is that not all isotopes fall within this belt of stability. In fact, the rest of the dots on the graph, those not dark blue, are radioactive isotopes. So, let's explore what makes an isotope stable, and why this concept is crucial in understanding the behavior of elements. Now, let's focus What exactly are stable isotopes? Well, stable isotopes are those that do not undergo radioactive decay. In other words, they remain unchanged over time. This is a significant concept because it ties back to the belt of stability we discussed earlier. Understanding why some isotopes are stable while others are not as essential in comprehending the behavior of elements. What exactly are st Now, let's shift our focus to radioactive isotopes. These isotopes, unlike stable ones, have a tendency to undergo radioactive decay, which means they change over time. This property has both scientific and practical implications, and we'll touch on some of their applications later. But first, Let's understand why they exhibit this behavior. Now, let Before we wrap up, let's briefly explore some practical applications of radioactive isotopes, which play a crucial role in various fields. To summarize, we've covered the concept of isotopes, the belt of stability, stable and radioactive isotopes, and their significance in understanding atomic behavior. Remember, this knowledge is foundational in the world of chemistry and nuclear science. Thank you for joining me today, and keep your curiosity alive as you delve further into the mysteries of the atomic world. Before we wrap Good day, students. Today, we're delving into the fascinating world of nuclear decay. This is a crucial concept in the realm of nuclear physics. Now, imagine you have different radionuclides, and they decay in different ways. What dictates the type of decay? Well, it primarily depends on a nuclide's neutron-to-proton ratio and how it compares with the ratio of nearby nuclei within what we call the belt of stability. Let's break this down further. We can envision three general situations, which we've labeled as 1, 2, and 3, as shown in figure 21.1. These situations provide insights into the diverse ways in which nuclear decay occurs. So, buckle up, because we're about to explore the intricacies of nuclear decay in depth. Good day, student. Hello, students. Today, we're delving into the fascinating world of nuclear physics. Our journey begins with nuclei that find themselves above the belt of stability. These are nuclei with high neutron-to-proton ratios, and they have an interesting way of trying to reach stability. They do this by emitting a beta particle. This emission process actually decreases the number of neutrons and increases the number of protons in the nucleus. You can think of it as a way for these nuclei to balance themselves and move closer to the belt of stability. Now, let's explore this concept further and understand how it all works. Hello, students. Welcome back, students. 
In our exploration of nuclear phenomena, let's now delve into the intriguing realm of nuclei below the belt of stability. These are nuclei with low neutron to proton ratios, and they find themselves on the quest to reach stability. How do they achieve this? Well, through two remarkable processes, positron emission and electron capture, as described in equations 21.5 and 21.7. Positron emission tends to be more common among lighter nuclei, while electron capture becomes increasingly prevalent as the nuclear charge gets higher. These processes play a crucial role in helping these nuclei balance their composition and inch closer to the elusive belt of stability. So, let's continue our journey into the fascinating world of nuclear physics. Welcome back, students. Good day, students. Today, we're delving into the fascinating world of radioactive decay chains. These are sequences of nuclear reactions that occur when unstable nuclei undergo successive emissions of particles. The ultimate goal of these chains? To transform an unstable nucleus into a stable one. There are three prominent radioactive decay chains found in nature. Uranium-238 to lead 206. Uranium-235 to lead 207 and thorium-232 to lead 208. Throughout these chains, you'll encounter two primary types of emissions, alpha and beta. Let's embark on this intriguing journey and explore the intricacies of how nature handles nuclear instability. Good day, student. Now, let's dive deeper into the first of our three natural radioactive decay chains, the uranium-238 to lead 206 decay chain. This chain commences with uranium-238, and from there, a series of emissions takes place. These emissions are the key players in the transformation process, leading us to the ultimate goal, the formation of a stable nucleus, lead-206. Keep in mind that as we explore this chain, we'll encounter both alpha and beta particles playing crucial roles in the decay process. Now, let's dive. Now. Moving on to our second natural radioactive decay chain, uranium-235 to lead 207. Just like in the previous chain, this one also begins with a specific unstable nucleus, uranium-235. Through a series of successive emissions, the chain progresses towards its ultimate goal, transforming into a stable nucleus, lead-207. Remember, as we journey through this chain, we'll be encountering alpha and beta particles as the primary agents of change. Now, moving Lastly, but certainly not least, let's explore our third and final natural radioactive decay chain, thorium-232 to lead 208. This chain's journey begins with thorium-232, an unstable nucleus. As with the others, it undergoes a sequence of emissions, each step bringing us closer to the ultimate destination a stable nucleus, LEAD-208. Once again, alpha and beta particles take center stage in driving the changes within this chain. It's truly remarkable how nature orchestrates these transformations. Lastly, but before we conclude our discussion on radioactive decay chains, it's crucial to understand the key actors in these processes, alpha and beta emissions. Alpha particles, composed of two protons and two neutrons, play a significant role in many of these chains. On the other hand, beta particles can be either electrons, known as beta minus, or positrons, known as beta plus. These emissions are at the heart of nuclear transformations and are essential to the formation of stable nuclei. So, as we wrap up, remember the significance of these particles in the grand scheme of radioactive decay chains. Before we conclude, Good day, students. Today, we're delving into the intriguing world of atomic nuclei and what makes them stable. Now, let's start with the basics. Good day, students. All right. Class, one of our key observations is the presence of what we call magic numbers. These are 2, 8, 20, 28, 50, 82, and 126. Nuclei containing these numbers of protons or neutrons tend to be more stable. Remember these numbers, as they play a crucial role in predicting stability. All right. Cla now, let's move on to our second observation. Nuclei with even numbers of protons, neutrons, or both are more likely to be stable compared to those with odd numbers. In fact, 
approximately 60% of stable nuclei fall into the even-even category. This is a significant factor in nuclear stability. Now, let's move. So, students, by combining our knowledge of magic numbers and even-even configurations, we can predict which nuclei are more likely to be stable. These observations are powerful tools in understanding the stability of atomic nuclei, which is essential in various scientific fields. So, student, as we conclude our discussion today, remember the magic numbers and the significance of even and odd configurations in predicting stable nuclei. These concepts are fundamental in nuclear physics and chemistry, helping us better understand the behavior of atoms at their core. Stay curious and keep exploring the fascinating world of science. As we conclude our Welcome, students. Today, we're delving into the intriguing topic of nuclei stability and the fascinating concept of magic numbers. Our journey begins with a look at the 2682 petabits nucleus, which is stable due to its magic number of 82 protons. But that's not all. We have another captivating example, tin. Tin boasts a magic number of 50 protons, and it stands out because it has not one, not two, but ten stable isotopes, making it a record holder among all the elements. Can you imagine the significance of these magic numbers in the stability of atomic nuclei? Let's dive deeper into this fascinating subject and explore the mysteries of nuclei stability. Welcome, students. Welcome, students, to our exploration of nuclear stability and the intriguing world of protons and neutrons within atomic nuclei. Today, we'll uncover some fascinating evidence that suggests the existence of special stability in pairs of protons and pairs of neutrons, much like the way electrons form pairs in molecules. This evidence sheds light on why stable nuclei tend to have an even number of protons and or neutrons, and it's quite a remarkable phenomenon. As we delve deeper into this topic, Keep in mind that elements with an odd number of protons tend to have fewer stable isotopes compared to their neighbors with even numbers of protons. To illustrate this, take a look at figure 21.3, which showcases the number of stable isotopes for elements up to xenon, Z. It's a fascinating journey into the world of atomic stability, and we're just getting started. Welcome, students. All right, students. Let's dive deeper into the concept of special stability in pairs of protons and neutrons. Think of it as a similar phenomenon to how electrons form pairs in molecules, creating stable chemical compounds. Within atomic nuclei, this special stability contributes to the prevalence of nuclei with an even number of protons and or neutrons. It's a bit like nature's way of maintaining order within the atomic world. As we continue our exploration, you'll see just how important these proton-neutron pairs are in understanding the behavior of atomic nuclei. All right, students. Now, students, let's delve into the consequences of odd numbers of protons within atomic nuclei. As I mentioned earlier, elements with an odd number of protons often have fewer stable isotopes compared to their counterparts with even numbers of protons. This is a remarkable observation that highlights the significance of nuclear stability and the role of protons in determining an element's behavior. To visually understand this contrast, take a look at the comparison chart we have here. It's clear evidence of the preference for even numbers in the atomic world. Now, students, let's now take a closer look at figure 21.3 which is a visual representation of stable isotopes for elements up to xenon, Z. This chart provides us with clear evidence of the preference for even numbers of protons in stable nuclei. As you can see, there's a distinct pattern where elements with an even number of protons tend to have more stable isotopes compared to their counterparts with odd numbers of protons. This pattern is a fundamental aspect of nuclear physics, and it's essential for understanding the behavior of elements in the atomic world. Let's now take a close. As we wrap up our discussion today, it's important to remember the significance of special stability in proton neutron pairs within atomic nuclei. This phenomenon helps explain why even numbered nuclei are more prevalent and stable in the world of atoms. It plays a crucial role in both nuclear physics and chemistry, influencing the behavior of elements and their isotopes. 
I encourage you to explore this topic further, as it's a fascinating area of study that continues to reveal the secrets of the atomic world. Thank you for joining me in this exploration, and I look forward to our next lesson in the world of science. As we wrap up our dis in our next topic, we'll take a closer look at Ernest Rutherford's groundbreaking experiment. He used alpha particles emitted by radium to induce nuclear transmutations. One of his notable achievements was converting nitrogen-14 into oxygen-17. Let's see how he did it. In our next Now, let's dive deeper into the nuclear transmutation process. We'll explore how alpha particles and protons play a crucial role in changing one nucleus into another. Understanding this process has significant implications in the field of nuclear physics and beyond. Now, let's... Good day, students. Today, we're venturing into the fascinating world of particle accelerators, devices that play a crucial role in scientific research. Our focus begins with a multi-stage linear accelerator, as depicted in figure 21.4a. In this accelerator, charged particles, like protons, undergo acceleration through a series of tubes of increasing length. But what makes this process truly intriguing is the manipulation of electrical charges on these tubes. They're changed from positive to negative strategically, ensuring that the particle is always attracted to the tube it's approaching, and repelled by the one it's leaving. This clever technique leads to the continuous acceleration of the particle until it possesses enough kinetic energy to collide with a target nucleus. And remember, this collision can unveil critical insights in the world of particle physics. Now, let's delve deeper into this concept. Good day, students. Welcome back, students. In our exploration of particle accelerators, we now turn our attention to the renowned Stanford Linear Accelerator, also known as SLAC. Figure 21.4, B, showcases this remarkable device, which stretches an astonishing 3.2 kilometers in length. But why does slack need to be this long, you might wonder. Well, the extended length allows it to achieve extraordinary levels of particle acceleration. Slack is a powerhouse of scientific discovery, enabling researchers to accelerate particles to incredible speeds. These high-energy particles can be used for various experiments, including probing the fundamental building blocks of matter. As we continue, you'll discover the significance of such accelerators in advancing our understanding of the universe. Welcome back, students. Hello again, students. Let's dive deeper into the physics that drive particle acceleration. Understanding how charged particles, like protons, gain kinetic energy is crucial. The key lies in the manipulation of electrical charges. By changing the charges on the tubes, we ensure that the particle is constantly drawn towards the tube it's approaching while being pushed away from the one it's leaving. This process builds up the particle's kinetic energy, which is essential for its ultimate collision with a target nucleus. This intricate dance between attraction and repulsion forms the foundation of particle accelerators, and it's a fascinating concept that underpins much of modern physics research. As we move forward, we'll explore more aspects of particle accelerators and their significance in scientific exploration. Hello again, st Good day, students. Today, we're delving into the fascinating world of particle accelerators, devices that propel charged particles to high speeds. Now, what's a common theme that you'll find in all particle accelerators? It's the need to create charged particles. These particles are crucial because we can manipulate them using electric and magnetic fields, allowing us to achieve incredible speeds and energies. But here's an important detail. We must maintain a high vacuum in the region where these particles travel. Why? So that they don't collide with any gas phase molecules along the way. Think of it as a superhighway for particles, with no traffic to slow them down. Now, let's explore this topic further. Good day, student. Welcome, students. Today, we're delving into the intriguing world of particle accelerators. Our first example takes us to the cyclotron, a remarkable device used to accelerate charged particles. Picture this. Charged particles moving in a spiral path between two D-shaped electrodes. What makes this possible? Well, alternating charges on these electrodes play a crucial role in accelerating these particles. To keep them on track, 
We also have powerful magnets above and below the device that ensure the particles follow a spiral path of increasing radius. Now, this is just the beginning of our particle acceleration journey. Let's explore more. Welcome, student. All right, class, we're taking the next step in understanding particle accelerators. We've moved from the cyclotron to the synchrotron. What's the key difference? In a synchrotron, the magnetic fields are synchronized in such a way that the particle's path becomes circular instead of a spiral. This synchronized movement brings with it certain advantages in particle acceleration. Let's explore how this change impacts our quest for scientific discovery. All right, class. Today, we're also taking a field trip to the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory in Batavia, Illinois. This facility is no ordinary one. It boasts a circumference of a whopping 6.3 kilometers. Why do we need such large-scale particle accelerators? Well, they are at the forefront of scientific research, conducting experiments that help us unlock the mysteries of the universe. At Fermilab, scientists explore the fundamental building blocks of matter, and the forces that govern them. As we continue our journey, remember that these accelerators are essential tools, in the pursuit of knowledge. Today, we're also... Before we... Wrap up. Let's reflect on the bigger picture. Particle accelerators like the cyclotron, synchrotron, and facilities like Fermilab are not just fascinating devices. They are the backbone of particle physics. These machines help us unveil the fundamental components of matter and the forces that shape our universe. Their contributions to our understanding of the cosmos are immeasurable. We're talking about high-energy physics research that challenges our notions of reality. As we conclude today's lesson, keep in mind the profound impact these accelerators have on the realm of science. Before we Before we say goodbye, let's connect the dots between what we've learned today and the fundamental principles of energy. In particle acceleration, we witness energy transformations in action. We're talking about kinetic and potential energy at play. These concepts come to life through the electrostatic interactions happening at the atomic level. It's a reminder that even in the world of particle physics, energy is a fundamental player. As we conclude this lesson, consider the intricate dance of energy within particle accelerators. Before we say good day, students. Today, we're delving into the fascinating world of transuranium elements. These are elements with atomic numbers greater than 92. And they come after uranium in the periodic table. Our journey begins with understanding what these elements are, and why they're so significant in the world of chemistry. Let's move on to the next topic to explore how some of these elements are created. Good day, student. In 1940, scientists made a groundbreaking discovery by producing two transuranium elements, neptunium, NP, and plutonium. They accomplished this feat by bombarding uranium-238 with neutrons. Now, let's take a closer look at the nuclear reactions that led to the creation of these elements. In 1940, our journey into the creation of neptunium and plutonium involves two crucial nuclear reactions. In the first reaction, uranium-238 captures a neutron, becoming uranium-239, which then transforms into neptunium-239, releasing an electron in the process. The second reaction takes neptunium-239 and turns it into plutonium-239, once again emitting an electron. Understanding these reactions is key to comprehending the production of these transuranium elements. Our journey into the... As we wrap up our exploration of transuranium elements, it's crucial to recognize their significance. These elements have played pivotal roles in nuclear technology and scientific research. However, it's important to note that they come with unique challenges, primarily due to their radioactivity. Despite these challenges, they continue to expand our understanding of the atomic world. As we wrap up our ex- That brings us to the end of our journey through the world of transuranium elements. We've learned about their definition, the method of production, the nuclear reactions involved, their significance, and the challenges they pose. Now, I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Feel free to ask anything related to today's lesson. That brings us to the end. Good day, class. Today, we're delving into the fascinating world of element discovery. 
Our journey begins with the remarkable story of a new element's detection, a discovery based on the observation of just a single atom. This elusive element undergoes a unique decay process known as alpha decay, transforming into DARMSTADTIUM273, which belongs to the element 110 family. The verification of this discovery has taken place on a global scale, with scientists in both Japan and Russia confirming its existence. Now, let's move on to our next topic to explore this process in more detail. Good day, class. Welcome back, students. In this topic, we'll dive deeper into the concept of alpha decay. Alpha decay is a type of radioactive decay where an unstable nucleus emits an alpha particle, which consists of two protons and two neutrons. This process leads to the transformation of our newly discovered element into DARMSTADTIUM273. Alpha particles play a crucial role in understanding the behavior of radioactive elements. Now, Let's proceed to our next topic to uncover more about the fascinating world of element decay. Welcome back, student. Hello again, everyone. We're continuing our exploration of this incredible element journey. After the initial alpha decay to DARMSTADTIUM273, a series of five more alpha decays take place. This sequence results in the formation of fermium-253, an element with unique properties and characteristics. Understanding fermium and its isotopes is crucial in the world of nuclear science. Now, let's progress to our next topic to learn more about the importance of these discoveries. Hello again, every- Welcome to our final topic, students. We conclude our journey with a look at the global verification of this groundbreaking discovery. Scientists from Japan and Russia collaborated to confirm the existence of this new element. Verification is a critical step in the scientific process, ensuring the accuracy and reliability of findings. The implications of this discovery extend far beyond the laboratory, impacting our understanding of the atomic world. As we wrap up, remember that science knows no borders, and collaboration is key to expanding our knowledge. Thank you for joining me on this enlightening journey. Welcome to our Good day, students. Today, we're delving into the intriguing world of creating new elements. It's a challenging and intricate process that requires our utmost attention. Imagine trying to make elements that have never existed before. These experiments are so complex that they only produce a tiny number of atoms of the new elements. Now, why is this important? Well, that's what we're here to explore. You see, before any new element can become an official part of the periodic table, it needs to go through a rigorous evaluation and reproduction process. In simple terms, we need to make sure what we've created is real and can be made again and again. This ensures the accuracy and reliability of our periodic table. So, let's dive deeper into this fascinating journey of scientific discovery. Good day, students. Good day, students. Today, we're going to delve into an intriguing aspect of chemistry, the naming of new elements. Our guide in this journey is the International Union for Pure and Applied Chemistry, or IUPAC for short. IUPAC plays a vital role in authorizing names for elements once they are experimentally discovered and confirmed. But how do they come up with these names? Well, there are specific criteria. Elements can be named after mythological concepts, minerals, places or countries, properties, or scientists. Now, let's explore the fascinating names and symbols that IUPAC approved for elements 113, 115, 117, and 118 in 2016. Get ready to uncover the stories behind Nihonium, Muscovium, Tennessine, and Organesson. Good day, student. Today, we're going to Start our journey by examining element 113, which goes by the name Nihonium, represented by the symbol NH. What's fascinating is that it's named after a mythological concept. Imagine the connection between this element and ancient stories. Let's move on to our next element. Today, we're going to... Next up, we have element 115, also known as Muscovium, with the symbol Mic. But here's the interesting part. It's named after a place, specifically the city of Moscow. Can you imagine what this element might have to do with this iconic city? Let's continue our journey to the next element. 
Next up, we have Our next stop is Element 117, known as Tennessine, represented by the symbol T's. What sets this element apart is that it's named after a U.S. state, and that state is Tennessee. How intriguing. Let's uncover more about Tennessine as we continue. Our next stop is Last but certainly not least, we have element 118, known as Organesson, symbolized by Og. What makes this element unique is that it's named after a scientist, recognizing their significant contributions to the field of chemistry. We'll explore the scientific legacy that led to the naming of Organesson shortly. But before we do that, remember, the names of elements often carry rich stories and connections. Now, let's dive deeper into the world of chemistry and the contributions of scientists. Last but, sir. Good day, students. Today, we're delving into the fascinating world of radiocarbon dating, a groundbreaking discovery that revolutionized archaeology. Our journey begins with the discovery of radiocarbon dating around 1950, and you won't believe the impact it had on this field. For the first time, scientists could determine the age of organic objects, like cloth, bone, parchment, or even charcoal from a fire, without relying on stratigraphy. This was a game-changer. But that's not all. Radiocarbon dating also allowed archaeologists to compare sites that were far apart from each other, revealing that similar innovations could emerge independently in different places. This challenged the previous notion that innovation spread slowly as people migrated, traded, and invaded neighboring regions. So, buckle up, because we're about to explore the intricacies of radiocarbon dating and its profound implications in the world of archaeology. Good day, student. Alright, students, let's dive deeper into the mechanics of radiocarbon dating. This process relies on the principles of radioactive decay, specifically involving the carbon-14 isotope. We use the decay of carbon-14 to determine the age of organic materials. As carbon-14 decays over time, it provides us with a clock to measure how long ago the organic material was once alive. This is incredibly useful in dating ancient artifacts and understanding the chronology of human history. But how exactly does it work? Let's explore the details in the next topic. All right, students. Welcome back, students. Now that we've grasped the basics of radiocarbon dating, let's see how it's applied in the field of archaeology. Radiocarbon dating is a powerful tool for archaeologists. It allows them to date organic artifacts and materials, providing valuable insights into the history of civilizations and ancient cultures. By using this method, Archaeologists can reconstruct historical timelines with greater accuracy, leading to advancements in our understanding of the past. So, if you're passionate about history and archaeology, you're in for a treat as we explore more about this incredible scientific technique. Welcome back, student. Today, we've uncovered the profound impact of radiocarbon dating on archaeological research. It's not just a tool, it's a game changer that has transformed the way we study history. This method challenged old assumptions and revealed that innovations could emerge independently in different parts of the world. It's given us a fresh perspective on human history and the dynamic nature of our past. So, as we conclude our journey into radiocarbon dating, remember that science has the power to rewrite history books, and this is one prime example. Stay curious and keep exploring the mysteries of our world. Today, we've un- Good day, students. Today, we're delving into the fascinating world of radioactive half-life and how it helps us calculate the ages of objects. But first, what exactly is radioactive half-life? It's a fundamental concept in nuclear physics that helps us understand the rate at which radioactive materials decay. Why is this important, you ask? Well, it's crucial for determining the ages of objects, and that's what we're going to explore today. We'll also discuss some selected radionuclides that play a significant role in this process. So, let's get started. Good day, students. All right, students, before we dive deeper into calculating object ages, let's understand the basics. Radioactive decay is the spontaneous process by which unstable atomic nuclei transform into more stable ones by emitting radiation. The concept of half-life comes into play here. It's the time it takes for half of the radioactive atoms in a sample to decay. And guess what? 
The half-life remains constant for each radioactive substance. So, by measuring the remaining amount of a radioactive substance and knowing its half-life, we can figure out how much time has passed since it was formed. This is a crucial tool in archaeology, geology, and many other fields. All right, student. Now, let's get down to the nitty-gritty of using half-life to calculate object ages. We can determine the age of an object by measuring the remaining amount of a radioactive isotope and comparing it to the initial amount. With the help of a simple mathematical formula, we can calculate how many half-lives have passed and, consequently, the age of the object. This method has countless real-life applications, from dating ancient fossils to estimating the age of Earth itself. It's like uncovering the secrets of the past through the power of science. Now, let's get... Let's explore some selected radionuclides that are commonly used in age calculations. First up, we have carbon-14, which is perfect for dating organic materials like ancient bones and wooden artifacts. Then, there's uranium-238, a key player in determining geological timescales, including the age of Earth itself. Lastly, we have potassium-40, which is handy for dating rocks and minerals. Each of these radionuclides has its unique properties and half-life, making them suitable for specific dating purposes. Let's explore some before we wrap up, let's look at some practical examples of age calculations using radioactive decay and half-life. We'll also discuss the challenges and limitations associated with these methods. Science is always evolving, and dating techniques have seen remarkable advancements over the years. So, while we've covered the basics today, remember that there's a world of exciting discoveries waiting to be made in the field of dating objects using radioactive decay. Keep exploring, and you might be the one to unlock the secrets of the past. Before we wrap up, as we've seen, the exact value of RBE isn't fixed and can vary based on several factors. This makes radiation biology a complex but crucial field of study. Understanding the relationships between dose, RBE, and effective dosage is vital for ensuring the safety of individuals exposed to radiation. So, remember, when it comes to radiation, knowledge is power, and safety is paramount. Stay curious, and keep learning. As we've seen, the Hello, students. Today, we're delving into the fascinating world of radioactive decay and the concept of half-life. Just like our previous examples, this is another instance of a first-order kinetic process. In first-order reactions, we have something called a characteristic half-life. This is the time it takes for half of a given quantity of a substance to undergo the reaction. Now, when we talk about nuclear decay rates, they are commonly expressed in terms of these half-lives. And here's the kicker. Each radioisotope, like strontium-90, has its own unique characteristic half-life. For, that half-life is precisely 28.8 years. This means that in 28.8 years, half of the sample will have transformed into YTTRIUM-90, and an electron. This concept is essential in understanding how radioisotopes behave and decay over time. Let's keep this in mind as we move forward in our exploration of nuclear processes. Hello, students. Good day, students. Today, we're delving into the intriguing world of radioactive decay and half-lives. It's a journey that will take us from the incredibly short half-lives, measured in millionths of a second to the astonishingly long half-lives, spanning billions of years. Now, let's grasp the concept of radioactive decay itself. Simply put, it's the process by which unstable atomic nuclei transform into more stable forms, by emitting radiation. But what's truly remarkable about this process, is that it's not influenced by external conditions. Whether it's scorching hot or freezing cold, high pressure or low pressure, or even in various chemical combinations, the half-life of a radioactive atom remains constant. This sets radioactive decay apart from many other natural processes, making it a unique and powerful tool for various applications. Now, let's explore some specific examples, and dive into the fascinating world of half-lives. Good day, student. Welcome to topic number two, where we're going to explore the incredible range of radioactive half-lives. Just imagine, we have radioisotopes with half-lives as short as millionths of a second, and on the other end of the spectrum, there are those with half-lives stretching into billions of years. It's truly mind-boggling. 
Let's take a moment to appreciate the diversity of these half-lives. For instance, some radioisotopes decay so quickly that they can barely be detected, while others endure for unimaginable stretches of time. This variation is what makes studying radioisotopes so fascinating. To help us understand this better, we have Table 21.5, which lists the half-lives of some radioisotopes. So, let's explore this table and see what amazing insights it offers. Welcome to Topic. Hello again, students. Now, let's talk about something truly unique to radioactive atoms, the resilience of their half-lives to external conditions. Unlike many other substances, such as toxic chemicals, the half-life of a radioactive atom remains constant, no matter the external environment. Whether it's blistering hot or frigidly cold, at high pressure or low pressure, and even in different chemical combinations. These atoms continue to decay at their own pace. This characteristic sets them apart and makes them challenging to control or manipulate through chemical reactions. While toxic chemicals can sometimes be rendered harmless through chemical treatments, radioactive atoms don't follow the same rules. This inherent stability is a critical factor in various scientific and practical applications involving radioisotopes. Let's keep exploring this fascinating world of radioactive decay. Hello again, students. As we wrap up our lesson today, remember that radiometric dating is a reliable and precise method for determining the age of objects. It relies on the constant half-life of radioactive isotopes, which act like dependable nuclear clocks. We've also discussed its wide-ranging applications in various scientific fields, from geology to archaeology. So, the next time you hear about dating ancient fossils or understanding the age of Earth's rocks, you'll know that radiometric dating is at the heart of these discoveries. Keep exploring the wonders of science, and I'll see you in our next lesson. As we wrap up our lesson. Good day, students. Today, we're delving into a captivating method known as radiometric dating, which allows us to determine the age of objects with remarkable precision. To grasp this concept, we need to understand that the half-life of any particular nuclide remains constant over time. This constancy is the key to using it as a kind of nuclear clock for dating purposes. Imagine it as a timer that never changes its rate. Now, let's explore how this process works in detail. Shall we? Good day, student. Before we go any further, let's understand the concept of half-life. Half-life is the time it takes for half of the radioactive atoms in a sample to decay. This is a constant, unchanging rate, which makes it incredibly useful for our dating purposes. It's like having a clock that ticks at a consistent pace. The half-life also serves as a unique identifier for different isotopes, helping us distinguish one from another. Now, let's continue our journey into radiometric dating. Before we go any f Now that we've got the half-life concept down, let's dive into the radiometric dating process. We use isotopes, which are variants of elements with different numbers of neutrons, and we pay close attention to their abundances. By measuring the ratio of parent isotopes, the original radioactive material, to daughter isotopes, the decay products, we can calculate the age of a sample. It's like solving a fascinating puzzle using the clues left behind by these isotopes. This process is at the heart of radiometric dating. Now that we've got the half- Radiometric dating isn't just a theoretical concept. It has real-world applications. We use this method to determine the ages of rocks and minerals, unlocking the secrets of Earth's geological history. Additionally, radiometric dating plays a crucial role in dating ancient fossils and artifacts, shedding light on our own human history. So, whether we're exploring the depths of the Earth or unraveling the mysteries of our past, radiometric dating is an invaluable tool. Let's continue our exploration into this fascinating field. Radiometric dating Good day, students. Today, we're delving into the intriguing world of radiocarbon dating, a technique that allows us to uncover the mysteries of the past. Our journey begins with an understanding of how carbon-14, a radioactive isotope, is formed. It all starts high up in the atmosphere, where cosmic rays create neutrons that convert nitrogen-14 into carbon-14. This newly formed carbon-14 then reacts with oxygen, giving birth to 14CO2. But why is this important? Well, 
This, labeled, CO2 becomes a part of our environment, getting absorbed by plants and entering the food chain through photosynthesis. This continuous process provides us with a small yet consistent source of carbon-14. And here's the fascinating part. Carbon-14 is radioactive and undergoes beta decay with a half-life of 5,700 years, meaning it transforms over time. This transformation is vital for radiocarbon dating, helping us piece together the past. Now, let's dive deeper into the mechanics of radiocarbon dating and how it unravels history. Good day, students. Hello, dear students. Today, we're delving into the fascinating world of carbon dating and the intriguing relationship between carbon-14 and carbon-12 in living organisms. You see, living plants and animals have a unique ability. They constantly take in carbon compounds from their environment. This process allows them to maintain a ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 that's remarkably similar to what we find in the Earth's atmosphere. But why is this significant, you ask? Well, it forms the foundation of a powerful scientific tool used to determine the age of ancient objects. Let's dive deeper into this intriguing concept. Hello, dear st Now that we understand the basic principle, let's talk about the carbon-14 dating method. Scientists use this method to estimate the age of organic materials, such as fossils or ancient artifacts. The key to this technique lies in measuring the ratio of carbon isotopes. Carbon-14, in particular, plays a crucial role. It has a known half-life, which means it gradually decays over time. By analyzing the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 in a sample, scientists can determine how long it has been since the organism died. It's like uncovering a hidden timeline of Earth's history. Fascinating, isn't it? Now that we under- All right, students, let's explore the real-world applications of carbon-14 dating. This technique is an invaluable tool for archaeologists and historians. It allows them to accurately date ancient artifacts and fossils, shedding light on our human history and the civilizations that came before us. However, it's important to note that carbon dating isn't without its challenges. Over extremely long timescales, the accuracy can diminish, and contamination from the environment can also affect results. Nonetheless, it's a remarkable method that has revolutionized our understanding of the past. All right, students. Today, we've covered the basics of carbon-14 dating. But did you know that carbon-14 has applications beyond archaeology? Yes, indeed. Carbon-14 is used as a tracer in environmental studies. Scientists can track the movement of carbon through ecosystems, helping us understand how carbon cycles in the natural world. It's even used to monitor atmospheric carbon-14 levels, which can provide insights into climate change and other environmental processes. So, you see, the influence of carbon-14 extends far beyond dating ancient relics. Today, we've covered- And there you have it, students. We've taken a deep dive into the world of carbon-14 dating. We've explored its significance in archaeology, how it helps us piece together the puzzle of human history and even its broader applications in environmental studies. This method has truly left an indelible mark on the scientific community and our understanding of the world around us. As you continue your journey in science, remember that every discovery opens up new avenues of knowledge. Keep exploring, keep learning, and who knows what mysteries you might uncover next. And there you have it. Good day, students. Today, we're diving into the fascinating world of radioactivity and how we measure it. We use a unit called activity to quantify how quickly a radioactive sample decays. This activity is expressed in units such as becquerels, BQ, and curies, C. One becquerel represents one nuclear disintegration per second, while one curie equals a whopping 3.7 times 10 to the 10 disintegrations per second. Imagine the incredible amount of energy and particles involved in these processes. Good day, student. Now, let's focus on the Curie C unit. The Curie is an older but still commonly used unit for measuring activity. It's defined as the rate of decay of 1 gram of radium. This unit is quite substantial, as 1 C equals 3.7 times 10 to the power of 10 disintegrations per second. Radium, by the way, is a naturally occurring radioactive element. Now, let's 
Let's put our knowledge to the test with an example. Say we have a 4.0 millicurie MCI sample of COBALT60. We want to convert it to C. We know that 1 C equals 1.5 times 10 to the power of 8 disintegrations. So our calculation would be 4.0 MCI times 1 C divided by 1.5 times 10 to the power of 8 disintegrations. This will give us the activity in C for our cobalt 60 sample. Let's put our knowledge. As we've seen, the exact value of RBE isn't fixed and can vary based on several factors. This makes radiation biology a complex but crucial field of study. Understanding the relationships between dose, RBE, and effective dosage is vital for ensuring the safety of individuals exposed to radiation. So, remember, when it comes to radiation, knowledge is power, and safety is paramount. Stay curious, and keep learning. As we've seen, the Good day, students. Today, we're delving into the fascinating world of radioactive decay and the mathematics behind it. Our journey begins with two critical concepts. The half-life and the decay constant. Pay close attention because by the end of this lesson, you'll understand how these concepts are interrelated and how they connect to the first order rate law. Let's move on to our next topic. Good day, students. Welcome back, students. Now, let's dive deeper into the components of the radioactive decay equation. T stands for the time interval of decay, which is a critical factor in understanding how radioactive substances change over time. Next, we have K, representing the decay constant. This constant tells us about the rate at which radioactive nuclei transform into other elements. In zero feet signifies the initial number of nuclei at time zero, essentially our starting point in this decay process. Finally, ENT represents the number of nuclei that remain after the specific time interval, T. It's crucial to grasp how these variables interplay and affect the behavior of radioactive substances. As we move forward, we'll explore real-life applications and the significance of these values in different scenarios. Welcome back, students. Hello again, students. Now, let's talk about the intriguing connection between mass and radioactive nuclei. The mass of a particular radioisotope is directly linked to the number of radioactive nuclei it contains. This means that as radioactive nuclei decay, the mass of the substance also changes. Additionally, we have activity, which is a measure of radioactivity. It quantifies how many radioactive decays occur per unit of time. As time progresses, both mass and activity undergo significant transformations, which are essential to understand when working with radioactive materials. In the next topics, we'll delve into specific examples and explore how these concepts apply to real-world scenarios. Stay with me as we unravel the mysteries of radioactive decay. Hello again, stu Welcome back, students. Now, let's put our knowledge into practice by exploring how we can substitute ratios in equation 21.20. As mentioned earlier, we have two options. We can use the mass ratio, comparing the mass at any time, t, to the mass at the initial time, t equals zero, or we can use the activity ratio, comparing the activity at time, t, to the activity at time, t equals zero. These substitutions allow us to adapt the equation to various scenarios and make calculations based on either mass or activity, depending on our specific needs. In our next examples, we'll see how this flexibility is crucial in real scientific applications. Stay tuned as we continue our journey into the world of radioactive decay and its practical implications. Welcome back, students. Welcome, class. Today, we're delving into an interesting application of radioactivity, domestic smoke alarms. These alarms are equipped with a special type called ionization and they contain a small amount of radioactive material, often AM241. But how do they work? Well, the radioactive material ionizes the air inside the alarm chamber, allowing a small electric current to flow. Now, here's the intriguing part. When there's smoke present, it disrupts this ion flow, setting off the alarm to warn us. However, it's crucial to note that the radiation emitted by these devices is strictly regulated to ensure safety in our homes. Let's explore further to understand how we quantify radiation in such applications. Welcome, class. Good day, students. 
Today, we're delving into the fascinating world of radioactivity detection and measurement, and we'll be doing it with a device called a Geiger counter. Now, how does this device work? Well, it's all based on a fundamental principle, radiation's ability to ionize matter. When radiation interacts with matter, it creates ions and electrons. And guess what? These ions and electrons enable the conduction of electrical current. But how does a Geiger counter actually look and function? Let's explore its basic design, as shown in figure 21.9. It's important to note that whenever incoming radiation generates ions, a current pulse is produced between the anode and the metal cylinder of the Geiger counter. And here's the interesting part. Each of these pulses is counted to estimate the amount of radiation. So, as we continue, you'll discover the inner workings of this remarkable device. Good day, student. Hello, students. Today, we're going to explore a fascinating phenomenon involving phosphors and their ability to emit light when they interact with radiation. This is an important concept in the field of radiation detection and measurement. So, what happens here? When radiation, such as alpha radiation, strikes a substance known as a phosphor, it causes the atoms, ions, or molecules within the phosphor to become excited, reaching a higher energy state. And guess what happens next? They release this energy in the form of light as they return to their ground states. This emission of light is what we'll be delving into today. Now, let's move on to understand how we can actually detect and measure radiation using a special instrument called a scintillation counter. Hello, student. All right, students, in our journey to understand the fascinating world of radiation and phosphors, we've arrived at the scintillation counter. This instrument plays a crucial role in detecting and quantifying radiation. When radiation strikes a phosphor, it generates flashes of light, and that's where the scintillation counter comes in. It's designed to detect and count these flashes of light. But that's not all. It electronically magnifies these flashes for precise measurement. This technology allows us to accurately determine the amount of radiation present in a given situation, making it an invaluable tool in various fields, including nuclear science and radiation safety. All right, let's dive deeper into a specific example to solidify our understanding. ZNS, a particular phosphor, is known to respond to alpha radiation. When alpha radiation interacts with ZNS, it excites the material, leading it to emit light. This is a prime example of the principles we've been discussing. By measuring the intensity of this emitted light, we can determine the presence and strength of alpha radiation in a given scenario. It's remarkable how this simple yet powerful phenomenon allows us to detect and quantify radiation effectively. Let's dive deep. As we wrap up our exploration of radiation and phosphors, it's essential to understand the significance of radiation measurement. This process is pivotal in many aspects of our lives, from ensuring nuclear safety to aiding in medical diagnostics and supporting scientific research. Accurate measurements are crucial for protecting both individuals and the environment from potentially harmful radiation exposure. So, remember, what we've learned today has real-world applications that contribute to our safety and well-being. As we wrap up our ex- Congratulations, students. We've journeyed through the intriguing world of radiation, phosphors, and the tools used to measure them. Today, we learned how phosphors emit light when radiation interacts with them and how scintillation counters are employed to detect and measure radiation accurately. ZNS, our example, showcased this phenomenon in action. As we conclude, remember that our understanding of radiation and its measurement has far-reaching implications for safety, healthcare, and scientific discovery. Keep exploring the wonders of science, and never stop seeking knowledge. The future is bright for curious minds like yours. Congratulations. Hello, class. Today, we're delving into the fascinating world of radio tracers and how they enable us to follow elements through their chemical journeys. One remarkable application of this technique is in the study of photosynthesis, where we use carbon-14 as a radio tracer. Carbon-14 is a radioisotope that can be readily detected, making it perfect for our purposes. Let's take a closer look at how this works with the chemical equation for photosynthesis. Here, we have 1,4-CO, enriched with carbon-1,4, combining with water and the energy from sunlight, thanks to chlorophyll, to produce 1,4-C which is glucose, along with oxygen. 
This process allows us to track the incorporation of carbon atoms from CO into glucose during photosynthesis. It's a powerful tool for understanding chemical reactions at a molecular level. Now, let's explore more about the world of radio tracers and their applications in chemistry. Hello, class. Hello, students. Today, we're delving into the fascinating world of radioisotopes and their role as radio tracers. Let's begin with the basics. Hello, student. Now, let's understand why radioisotopes are so useful. Isotopes of an element have the same number of protons but may vary in the number of neutrons. This results in identical chemical properties, making them behave the same way in reactions. Now, let's un Now, let's dive into the heart of our topic. Radioisotopes, when mixed with stable isotopes, act as radio tracers. But what are radio tracers, and how do they work? Let's explore. Now, let's dive. As we've seen, the exact value of RBE isn't fixed and can vary based on several factors. This makes radiation biology a complex but crucial field of study. Understanding the relationships between dose, RBE, and effective dosage is vital for ensuring the safety of individuals exposed to radiation. So, remember, when it comes to radiation, knowledge is power, and safety is paramount. Stay curious, and keep learning. As we've seen, the as we've seen, the exact value of RBE isn't fixed and can vary based on several factors. This makes radiation biology a complex but crucial field of study. Understanding the relationships between dose, RBE, and effective dosage is vital for ensuring the safety of individuals exposed to radiation. So, remember, when it comes to radiation, knowledge is power, and safety is paramount. Stay curious, and keep learning. As we've seen, the Students, here's where things get truly mind-blowing. In the case of uranium-238 decay, the mass change involved is absolutely enormous. It's a staggering 50,000 times greater than the mass change when we burn one mole of methane, CH. This means that the energy changes associated with nuclear reactions are on a completely different scale. Just imagine the incredible amounts of energy that can be harnessed from such reactions. It's a testament to the power of science and nuclear physics. Students, here's Good day, students. Today, we're delving into a remarkable realm, nuclear reactions and the immense energy they unleash. Our first concept to grasp is the conversion of increment m, which represents a change in mass, into kilograms, the SI unit of mass. Why? Well, to obtain increment e, the energy change, in joules, the SI unit of energy. Now, here's the thrilling part. The negative sign you see here tells us that energy is being released in this reaction. In this case, it's a staggering over 400 billion joules per mole of uranium. To put that into perspective, this amount of energy could power the average annual electricity consumption of about 10,000 homes. So, nuclear reactions aren't just fascinating scientifically, they have incredible real-world implications. Let's explore further. Good day, student. Hello, students. Today, we're delving into the fascinating world of nuclear binding energies. Our journey starts with a discovery made in the 1930s. Scientists found something remarkable. The masses of nuclei are always less than the masses of the individual nucleons they're composed of. To illustrate this, let's consider the helium-4 nucleus, which is essentially an alpha particle. It has a mass of 4.00150 atomic mass units, U. Now, a proton weighs about 1.00728 U, and a neutron about 1.00866 U. If we combine two protons and two neutrons, you'd expect a total mass of 4.03188 U, right? But it's not that simple. Stay with us as we uncover the secrets of nuclear binding energies. Hello, student. Welcome back, students. Now. Let's unravel the mystery of why the mass of nuclei is less than the sum of their individual nucleons. It all comes down to binding energy. You see, when nucleons come together in a nucleus, they release energy. This energy, according to Einstein's famous equation E equals mix squared, has an equivalent mass. This is a fundamental principle of nuclear physics. So, even though it seems like some mass disappears in a nucleus, it's actually converted into energy. 
Isn't that fascinating? Let's explore further. Welcome back, stu- Hello again, students. Now that we understand the concept of nuclear binding energies, let's talk about their implications. These energies play a crucial role in nuclear reactions. When nuclei undergo changes, such as fusion or fission, they release a tremendous amount of energy. This energy is what powers nuclear reactors and generates electricity. Additionally, understanding binding energies helps us predict the stability and decay of nuclei. It's a cornerstone of nuclear physics with far-reaching applications. Let's dive deeper into these implications. Hello again, st Hello, class. Today, we're delving into the fascinating concept of nuclear binding energy. This is the energy needed to break apart the nucleus into its individual nucleons. Understanding this is crucial to grasp the stability of atomic nuclei. We often measure it in MeV, which stands for million electron volts. Now, let's explore further. Hello, class. Welcome back, students. Our next stop is, mass defect. This term refers to the difference in mass between a nucleus and its individual nucleons. We calculate it by subtracting the mass of the nucleus from the mass of its nucleons. Why is this important, you ask? Well, it's deeply connected to Einstein's famous equation E equals mix squared and plays a crucial role in determining nuclear binding energy. Welcome back, student. Greetings, curious minds. In our text, there's a fascinating comparison in Table 21.7. It lets us see how nuclear binding energy and mass defect vary among three different elements. This comparison is a valuable tool to understand how nuclei of various elements are bound together. For specific data, I encourage you to refer to Table 21.7 in your textbooks. Keep exploring the world of nuclear physics, my young scholars. Greetings, Cure. Good day, students. Today, we're delving into the intriguing world of binding energies per nucleon. These values play a crucial role in comparing the stabilities of different combinations of nucleons, helping us understand the core of atomic nuclei. So, what exactly is binding energy per nucleon, and why is it so significant? Let's find out. Good day, students. Now, let's get into the nitty-gritty details. Binding energy per nucleon is a measure of the energy required to hold a nucleus together, divided by the number of nucleons in that nucleus. We calculate it using a specific formula, which helps us understand how tightly the nucleons are bound within the nucleus. Now, let's... But why do we care about nuclear stability? Well, understanding which combinations of nucleons are more stable is essential in nuclear physics. Binding energy per nucleon acts as our guide in this journey. It allows us to compare different combinations, such as 4-2-HE and 2-2-1-H, and determine which ones are more stable. But why do we care about... Now, let's dive into the visual aspect. Figure 21.12 provides us with valuable information. It's a graph that plots the average binding energy per nucleon. We'll explore how to read and interpret this graph to gain insights into nuclear stability. Now, let's... Time to put our knowledge into practice. We'll compare the binding energies per nucleon for various combinations of nucleons. As an example, we'll take a close look at the stability comparison between 4-2-He and 2-2-1-H. Prepare to see how these values can help us understand the universe at a fundamental level. Time to put our knowledge and there you have it, students. We've journeyed through the world of binding energies per nucleon, understanding their importance in comparing nuclear stability. I encourage you to delve deeper into nuclear physics as it unveils the mysteries of the atomic nucleus and the forces that hold it together. Keep exploring, keep learning, and who knows what new discoveries you might make in this fascinating field. And there you have it. This is a teacher-style narration. Welcome, students to an exploration of nuclear reactions and their remarkable energy-producing capabilities. Our journey begins with the concept of nuclear fission. When heavy nuclei are split into two mid-sized nuclei, they gain stability and, in the process, release a significant amount of energy. It's this process that's harnessed to generate energy in nuclear power plants. Imagine the immense power locked within the nucleus of an atom, but there's more to the story. 
When very light nuclei combine, or fuse together, they form more massive nuclei, and this fusion process releases even greater amounts of energy. This fusion, my friends, is the essential energy producing process in celestial bodies like the sun and other stars. It's the very process that keeps our sun shining brightly. As we delve deeper into nuclear reactions and their role in energy production, you'll discover the incredible forces at play in the universe. This is a teacher st Good day, students. Today, we're delving into the fascinating world of nuclear power, specifically focusing on a process called nuclear fission. It's worth noting that over 11% of the electricity generated worldwide comes from nuclear power plants. However, this percentage can vary from one country to another, as we'll see shortly. Currently, there are 440 commercial nuclear power plants in operation across 30 different countries, and there are approximately 65 more under construction. Nuclear fission is at the heart of these power plants, and it's a process that allows us to harness a tremendous amount of energy. Now, let's explore this concept further. Good day, students. Welcome back, students. In our previous topic, we introduced the concept of nuclear power and mentioned nuclear fission. Now, let's dive deeper into the process of nuclear fission. Nuclear fission is defined as the splitting of heavy atomic nuclei. When this happens, it releases an enormous amount of energy. To control this powerful reaction, nuclear power plants use something called control rods, which play a crucial role in regulating the process. Understanding the intricacies of nuclear fission is key to harnessing its potential for energy generation. So, let's continue our journey into the world of atomic energy. Welcome back, students. Hello again, students. In this topic, we'll explore the global impact of nuclear power. We've already seen that it contributes significantly to electricity generation. However, there are also important considerations when it comes to the environment and emissions. We'll discuss both the advantages and challenges associated with nuclear power. Additionally, we'll take a glimpse into the future of nuclear energy and its role in the ever-evolving world of energy production. Understanding these aspects is crucial in our quest to grasp the full scope of nuclear power's impact. Hello again, students. Welcome to our next topic, students. We'll be exploring nuclear power on a global scale. There are regional variations in how different countries use nuclear energy, and some nations are leading the way in nuclear energy production. We'll also discuss the critical safety measures and international cooperation involved in the operation of nuclear power plants. To wrap it up, we'll look at future trends in nuclear power development, which are essential to understanding the evolving landscape of energy production worldwide. Stay with me as we continue our exploration. Welcome to our next Hello, students. In our final topic, we'll delve into an essential aspect of nuclear power, the management of nuclear waste and the decommissioning of nuclear power plants. This is a topic of great significance, as it involves long-term challenges and safety considerations. We'll also touch on some innovative methods for the safe disposal of nuclear waste. Understanding these aspects is crucial for a holistic understanding of nuclear power and its impact on our environment. So, let's conclude our journey into the world of nuclear fission and its role in energy generation. Hello, student. Good day, students. Today, we're delving into the fascinating world of nuclear reactors and the incredible process of nuclear fission, specifically focusing on URANIUM-235. Now, let's start with a quick introduction to nuclear reactors. These are facilities designed to harness the power of nuclear reactions to generate electricity. The key player in this process is uranium-235, which was the first nucleus discovered to undergo nuclear fission. But what exactly is nuclear fission? Well, it's a process where a nucleus, in this case, URANIUM-235, splits apart when it's struck by a slow-moving neutron. This split results in the release of a tremendous amount of energy. It's a discovery that revolutionized our understanding of energy generation. But uranium-235 is not alone in this, as uranium-233 and plutonium-239 also exhibit similar behavior. So, today, we'll explore the marvels of nuclear fission and its role in powering our world. Let's continue our journey into the world of atomic energy. Good day, student.
Good day, students. Today, we're delving into the intriguing world of nuclear fission and the fascinating aftermath known as fission products. Our journey begins with nuclear fission, a process where the nucleus of an atom, such as uranium-235, splits into two or more smaller nuclei. Now, what's particularly intriguing is that these newly formed nuclei, known as fission products, are themselves radioactive. This means they continue to undergo nuclear decay, emitting various particles and radiation. In the case of uranium-235 fission, more than 200 isotopes of 35 different elements have been discovered among the fission products, and the majority of them are indeed radioactive. This phenomenon has profound implications in the field of nuclear physics and energy production. So, let's continue our exploration into the world of nuclear reactions and their consequences. Good day, students. Good day, students. Today, we're delving into a fascinating topic, chain reactions in nuclear fission. To start, we need to understand what chain reactions are and how they play a pivotal role in processes like nuclear fission. Pay close attention as we explore the coefficients of neutrons and their significance in these reactions. Good day, student. Hello, everyone. Today, we're delving into the intriguing world of fission chain reactions, and exploring a crucial concept known as critical mass. In the world of nuclear reactions, it's essential to have just the right amount of fissionable material to sustain a chain reaction. If the mass is too small, neutrons escape before they can trigger additional fission events. However, when we have a sufficient amount of material, we reach what we call the critical mass. For uranium-235, this critical mass is around 50 kilograms. When we achieve this critical mass, each fission event on average produces another fission event, and the chain reaction continues at a constant, controllable rate. It's a fascinating concept in the world of nuclear science. Let's move forward and explore more about the intricacies of fission chain reactions. Hello, everyone. Good day, students. Today, we're delving into the intriguing world of nuclear fission and the concept of critical mass. This is a crucial topic when discussing nuclear reactions. Now, picture this. When we have more than a critical mass of fissionable material in a setup, something fascinating happens. Very few neutrons manage to escape. But why is this important? It's because this chain reaction multiplies the number of fissions that occur. And when that multiplication occurs without control, it can lead to a nuclear explosion. We call a mass in excess of the critical mass a supercritical mass. The effect of mass on a fission reaction is crucial, and we'll explore this in the upcoming topics. So, let's move on to figure 21.16 to visualize how mass influences a fission reaction. Good day, students. Welcome back, students. In our previous topic, we introduced the concept of critical mass and how it relates to escaping neutrons in a chain reaction. Now, let's dive deeper into the influence of mass on fission reactions. As mentioned, when we exceed the critical mass, we enter the realm of a supercritical mass, and that's when things get intense. Uncontrolled reactions, as we mentioned earlier, can lead to a nuclear explosion. To help us visualize this, let's take a look at figure 21.16, which provides a graphical representation of how mass impacts fission reactions. It's essential to understand these principles to grasp the significance of critical mass in nuclear physics. Welcome back, students. Hello again, students. We're continuing our journey into the world of critical mass and nuclear reactions. Critical mass is a pivotal concept. It's essentially the point where there's a delicate balance between escaping and initiating neutrons in a chain reaction. When we can control this balance, we have controlled reactions that can be harnessed for various purposes. However, if this balance tips towards the uncontrolled side, it can lead to a potentially catastrophic nuclear explosion. To help us solidify our understanding, let's take a look at a diagram that illustrates the concept of critical mass. Understanding this balance is vital in the field of nuclear science. Hello again, students. Welcome to our next topic, students. Here, we're going to explore the implications of a supercritical mass. As we've discussed, when we exceed the critical mass threshold, we enter the realm of uncontrolled chain reactions. This situation has significant implications, particularly in terms of the potential for a nuclear explosion. 
Understanding this concept is not only crucial for scientific knowledge but also for addressing safety concerns, especially when it comes to the development and handling of nuclear weapons. It underscores the importance of responsible practices in the world of nuclear science. Welcome to our next All right, students, we're approaching the conclusion of our discussion on critical mass. Let's quickly recap what we've learned. Critical mass is the point where we have a balance between escaping and initiating neutrons in a chain reaction. This balance is a critical factor in nuclear reactions. We've seen how exceeding the critical mass and entering the supercritical realm can have severe consequences, including the potential for nuclear explosions. It emphasizes the importance of controlling reactions in the world of nuclear science. As we move forward in our studies, remember the significance of this concept and how it influences the world of nuclear physics. Thank you for your attention, and stay curious about the fascinating world of science. All right, stu- Good day, students. Today, we're delving into the world of nuclear reactors and how they harness the power of nuclear fission to generate energy. Our journey begins by understanding the key components of a typical nuclear reactor core. These components play a crucial role in the controlled release of energy. Now, let's move on to our next topic to explore these components in more detail. Good day, student. As we continue our exploration of nuclear reactors, it's important to know the core components that make them work effectively. Our reactor's heart consists of four principal elements, fuel elements, control rods, a moderator, and a primary coolant. Each of these components plays a unique role in ensuring the safe and efficient operation of the reactor. Let's delve deeper into each of these components on the following topics. As we continue our ex Our next focus is on the fuel elements within a nuclear reactor. These elements contain a fissionable substance, often uranium-235, which is essential for the nuclear reaction. However, the natural abundance of uranium-235 is quite low so it needs to be enriched to a higher percentage, typically between 3% to 5%, to sustain the chain reaction in the reactor core. Additionally, these fuel elements are protected by encasements made of zirconium or stainless steel. This combination ensures efficient energy production. Moving forward, we'll delve into the role of control rods and moderators. Our next focus is... Welcome, students. Today, we're delving into a crucial component of nuclear reactors, control rods. These rods play a pivotal role in ensuring the safe and efficient operation of nuclear reactors. Let's start by discussing their composition. Control rods are typically made of materials like boron-10 or a special alloy composed of silver, indium, and cadmium. Now, why are these control rods so important? Well, they have two primary functions. First, they help regulate the flux of neutrons within the reactor. This regulation is essential to maintain a self-sustaining nuclear reaction. Second, control rods are instrumental in preventing the reactor core from overheating. As we explore further, you'll discover the intricate balance between these control rods and the nuclear reactions happening within the reactor core. So, let's continue our journey into the world of nuclear energy and control mechanisms. Welcome, students. All right, students, let's take a closer look at how these control rods function. One of their key roles is to absorb neutrons. When neutrons are absorbed by the control rods, it reduces the neutron flux within the reactor. But here's where it gets interesting. The degree to which control rods are inserted into the reactor core can be adjusted. By inserting them deeper, we decrease the neutron flux, slowing down the nuclear reaction. Conversely, withdrawing the control rods allows more neutrons to interact with the fuel, speeding up the reaction. It's like the accelerator and brake pedals in a car, but for nuclear reactions. This precise control is essential to maintain the reactor's desired power level and, most importantly, to keep it safe. All right, student. Now, let's talk about the critical role these control rods play in preventing reactor overheating. As the nuclear reaction proceeds, there's always a risk of excessive heat generation. If left unchecked, this could lead to a catastrophic situation. This is where our trusty control rods come into play once again. They absorb excess neutrons, essentially acting as a safety mechanism. By doing so, they ensure that the reactor remains stable and within the desired temperature range. 
Think of them as the guardians of the reactor's well-being, always ready to step in and maintain the delicate balance of nuclear energy production. Now, let's talk. As we wrap up our discussion on control rods, it's essential to emphasize their significance in overall reactor safety. These rods are not just components. They are the frontline defense against potential disasters. However, it's important to note that control rods are just one aspect of reactor safety. Nuclear reactors have multiple layers of safety systems and protocols in place to ensure their safe operation. These measures include backup cooling systems, containment structures, and emergency shutdown procedures. All of these components work together to make nuclear reactors one of the safest sources of energy when operated correctly. So, as we conclude our exploration of control rods, remember that safety is a top priority in the world of nuclear energy. As we wrap up our dis Let's take a moment to recap what we've learned today. We've discussed the composition and vital functions of control rods in nuclear reactors. These rods are made of materials like boron-10 or special alloys and play a dual role in regulating neutron flux and preventing reactor overheating. Their importance in maintaining overall reactor safety cannot be overstated. Now, it's time for some classroom discussion. What questions do you have about control rods and their role in nuclear reactors? Let's engage in a thoughtful conversation and deepen our understanding of this critical aspect of nuclear energy. Let's take a Hello, students. Today, we're delving into an essential aspect of nuclear fission, the role of neutron speed in triggering this process. You see, the probability of a neutron triggering the fission of a uranium-235 nucleus depends on its speed. Neutrons generated during fission events typically have very high speeds, often exceeding 10,000 km per second. Now, here's where our moderator comes into play. Its job is to slow down these high-speed neutrons to just a few kilometers per second. Why? Because slower neutrons are much more likely to be captured by fissionable nuclei, initiating more fission reactions. The two common moderators we'll explore today are water and graphite. So, let's dive deeper into the fascinating world of nuclear fission and the role of neutron speed. Hello, student. Welcome back, students. Now that we understand that neutron speed plays a crucial role in the probability of triggering fission, let's delve deeper into this concept. Simply put, slow neutrons are much more effective at initiating fission reactions. The reason is that they spend more time in the vicinity of fissionable nuclei, increasing the likelihood of a successful collision. On the other hand, higher speed neutrons are less efficient at causing fission. So, our moderators, like water and graphite, step in to slow down these speedy neutrons, increasing our chances of sustaining the fission chain reaction. Neutron speed is indeed a critical factor in the world of nuclear reactions. Welcome back, students. All right, students, let's now explore the moderators in more detail. The two most commonly used moderators in nuclear reactors are water and graphite. Water serves as a moderator by slowing down neutrons through collisions. When fast neutrons collide with water molecules, they lose energy and decrease in speed. On the other hand, graphite moderates neutrons through scattering. Neutrons bounce off the carbon atoms in graphite, gradually losing their high speeds. The choice of moderator depends on the specific design and requirements of the nuclear reactor being used. So, whether it's water or graphite, these moderators are essential in controlling neutron speed for efficient fission reactions. All right, students. As we near the end of our lesson, let's recap what we've learned today. Neutron speed is a critical factor in the probability of triggering nuclear fission. Slower neutrons are far more effective at initiating fission reactions. To achieve this, we employ moderators like water and graphite, which play a pivotal role in slowing down high-speed neutrons. The choice of moderator depends on the specific reactor design and requirements. So, remember, it's all about controlling neutron speed to harness the incredible power of nuclear fission. Great job, students, for exploring this complex but fascinating topic with me. As we near the Good day, students. Today, we're delving into a crucial aspect of nuclear reactors, which is the primary coolant. 
The primary coolant plays a vital role in these reactors by carrying away the heat generated during the nuclear chain reaction at the core. In one of the most common commercial reactor designs, the pressurized water reactor or PWR, water takes on a dual role. It acts as both the moderator and the primary coolant. Let's explore this in more detail on our next topic. Good day, student. Good day, students. Today, we're delving into the fascinating world of nuclear power plant design. You might be surprised to know that the design is quite similar to that of power plants burning fossil fuels, with a key difference, the burner is replaced by a reactor core. Let's explore this concept further. Good day, student. Now, let's take a closer look at the pressurized water reactor, which is currently the most popular design for nuclear power plants. It features a closed system for the primary coolant, significantly reducing the possibility of radioactive products escaping from the core. Now, let to ensure safety, the reactor is surrounded by a reinforced concrete containment shell. This serves a dual purpose. It shields personnel and nearby residents from radiation and protects the reactor from external forces. Safety is a top priority in nuclear power plant design to ensure safety. Now, let's explore the fascinating process of heat transfer within the nuclear power plant. The primary coolant, which becomes very hot as it passes through the reactor core, transfers much of its heat to a secondary coolant. This transfer results in the conversion of the secondary coolant into high-pressure steam, a crucial step in generating power. Now, let's As we've seen, the exact value of RBE isn't fixed and can vary based on several factors. This makes radiation biology a complex but crucial field of study. Understanding the relationships between dose, RBE, and effective dosage is vital for ensuring the safety of individuals exposed to radiation. So, remember, when it comes to radiation, knowledge is power, and safety is paramount. Stay curious, and keep learning. As we've seen, the Hello, students. Today, we're delving into a crucial topic, the disposal of radioactive waste. Scientists and researchers worldwide are dedicating significant efforts to find safe and effective solutions for handling radioactive materials. One promising approach involves transforming these wastes into solid materials, such as glass, ceramics, or synthetic rock, effectively immobilizing them. These solidified materials are then placed in containers designed with high corrosion resistance and durability. The final step in this process is burying these containers deep underground, ensuring the long-term containment of radioactive materials. This is a critical step in managing the environmental impact of nuclear technologies. Now, let's explore further details about the methods and considerations involved in this process. Hello, students. Hello, students. Today, we're going to delve into the intriguing topic of nuclear power and its resurgence on the global energy stage. Despite facing numerous challenges, nuclear power is making a modest comeback as a significant energy source. Why, you ask? Well, concerns about climate change, driven by rising levels of atmospheric CO2, have led to increased support for nuclear power as a vital component of our future energy landscape. But that's not all. We're witnessing a growing demand for power in rapidly developing countries, especially in places like China. This surge in demand has ignited a construction boom of new nuclear power plants in these regions. It's a fascinating development, and we're going to explore it in detail as we move forward. Hello, student. Welcome, students. Today, we're delving into the fascinating world of nuclear fusion, particularly as it happens within our very own sun. This is where energy is produced on an astronomical scale. The key concept here is fusion, where light nuclei fuse together to create heavier ones. It's like nature's own nuclear power plant. In the sun, there are numerous fusion processes at work, and we'll be exploring a few of them in detail. Let's start with the fusion of two hydrogen nuclei, each with one proton. When they come together, they form a helium nucleus with two protons and release a positron. This is just one of the incredible reactions powering our sun. Now, let's continue our journey into the heart of the sun's energy production. Welcome, student. Alright, students, let's dive deeper into our first fusion reaction within the sun. 
It involves the collision of two hydrogen nuclei, each containing a single proton. When these protons merge, they form two helium nuclei and even release a positron, a particle with a positive charge. This process is one of the building blocks of the sun's energy production. It's incredible how nature orchestrates these reactions on a grand scale, powering our entire solar system. All right. Now, onto our second fusion reaction in the sun. Here, a hydrogen nucleus, which has one proton, combines with a deuterium nucleus, which has one proton and one neutron. The result is the formation of a helium-3 nucleus. It's amazing how these interactions within the sun's core contribute to the immense energy it radiates, sustaining life on our planet, and more. Now, on let's keep the fusion reactions coming. In our third example, two helium-3 nuclei, each containing two protons and one neutron, collide. This results in the formation of a helium-4 nucleus, and a single hydrogen nucleus. These reactions might seem complex, but they're what keep our sun shining brightly. Nature's energy production is truly a marvel. Let's keep the fusion And now, for our final fusion reaction within the sun, we have the collision of a helium-3 nucleus, and a hydrogen nucleus. When these two come together, they form a helium-4 nucleus, and release a positron, which is a positively charged particle. This reaction is yet another piece, of the complex puzzle, that generates the sun's boundless energy. Nature's power plant truly knows, how to deliver. And now, hello, students. Today, we're delving into the fascinating world of achieving incredibly high temperatures for a specific purpose, and it involves some explosive concepts. Our first point to explore is the use of an atomic bomb to initiate fusion reactions. You might have heard of thermonuclear or hydrogen bombs. These operate on the principle of achieving extremely high temperatures through nuclear fusion. However, and this is crucial to understand, this approach is absolutely unacceptable when it comes to generating power for everyday use. Why, you ask? Well, that's what we'll uncover in the following topics. So, let's move forward and explore the safer alternatives for power generation. Hello, students. Now, my dear students, let's dive deeper into why using atomic bombs for power plants is an unthinkable idea. First and foremost, atomic bombs are designed for destruction, not for the sustainable generation of energy. They come with inherent dangers that include catastrophic consequences. Imagine the devastating impact such explosions could have on our environment and society. This approach is simply unsustainable, when our goal is to provide safe and reliable power for our communities. But don't worry. There are much safer and more responsible methods for power generation, that we'll explore shortly. Stay with me as we uncover these alternatives. Now, my dear all right, students, it's time to shift our focus to a more promising avenue for power generation. Instead of explosive atomic bombs, we're looking at harnessing the power of nuclear fusion for energy. In controlled fusion reactions, we can achieve the high temperatures needed without resorting to destructive means. The beauty of this approach lies in its minimal environmental impact, and the potential to provide us with a clean and sustainable energy source. So, stay tuned. As we explore the world of controlled nuclear fusion, and its potential to revolutionize power generation. All right, student. Welcome back, students. As we delve further into the exciting realm of controlled fusion, let's ponder its potential advantages, the scientific and engineering challenges that lie ahead, and its promise for a sustainable future. While we're not detonating atomic bombs, we're certainly igniting a spark of hope for clean and limitless energy. However, it's important to acknowledge that there are hurdles to overcome. So, fasten your seatbelts as we journey through the possibilities and challenges of controlled fusion. This could be the future of energy. And you're right here, on the cutting edge of discovery. Welcome back, students. Welcome, students. Today, we're delving into the intriguing world of fusion energy and the challenges it presents. Fusion, as an energy source, holds incredible promise, but it's not without its hurdles. Our first challenge is the need for incredibly high temperatures to kickstart the fusion reaction. But that's just the beginning. 
We also face the issue of confining this reaction. No known material can withstand the extreme temperatures required for fusion to occur. That's where our hero, the tokamak, enters the stage. This remarkable apparatus employs strong magnetic fields to contain and heat the fusion reaction. In fact, it has achieved temperatures exceeding 100 million Kelvin. However, despite these advancements, scientists are still grappling with a fundamental issue. Generating more power from fusion than is consumed over a sustained period. It's a puzzle we're determined to solve as we explore the potential of fusion energy. Welcome, students. All right. Let's dive deeper into the first challenge of fusion energy, those scorching temperatures. Fusion reactions demand incredibly high temperatures, and when I say high, I mean temperatures exceeding 100 million Kelvin. Just imagine the energy involved in reaching these extremes. However, achieving and maintaining these temperatures consistently presents a significant challenge. It's like trying to harness the power of a star right here on Earth. As we move forward, we'll explore how scientists are tackling this temperature puzzle. All right. Let now, let's talk materials. Fusion reactions generate such intense heat and radiation that no known materials on Earth can withstand them. It's a bit like trying to contain a miniature sun. However, scientists are hard at work researching and testing materials that could withstand these extreme conditions. We're looking for materials that won't just survive but thrive in the heart of a fusion reactor. So, stay tuned as we explore the materials of the future in our quest for practical fusion energy. Now, let's talk. Let's shine a spotlight on the tokamak, our potential solution to the fusion puzzle. The tokamak is a fascinating apparatus that uses powerful magnetic fields to both contain and heat the fusion reaction. It's like having a magnetic bottle to hold the extreme temperatures required for fusion. In fact, it has successfully achieved those mind-boggling temperatures necessary for fusion to occur. The tokamak is a crucial piece of the fusion puzzle, and we'll delve deeper into how it works and its role in our quest for practical fusion energy. Let's shine a spot. Last but not we face the ultimate challenge in the world of fusion energy, generating more power than we consume over a sustained period. This is the holy grail of practical fusion energy. While we've made significant progress in achieving fusion reactions, we're still working on cracking the power generation puzzle. It's a complex and exciting journey, and it holds the promise of a nearly limitless, clean energy source. As we continue our exploration, keep in mind that fusion energy could revolutionize how we power our world in the future. Last but not we Good day, students. Today, we're delving into the intriguing topic of radiation exposure. It might surprise you, but we're continuously exposed to various forms of radiation from both natural and artificial sources. Our journey begins by understanding the diverse sources of radiation that surround us. These sources include the sun, which emits infrared, ultraviolet, and visible radiation, radio and television stations that transmit radio waves, microwave ovens emitting microwaves, medical procedures involving x-rays, and even radioactivity from naturally occurring materials. It's quite a mix of radiation. Now, let's explore the characteristics and effects of these different types of radiation. Good day, student. Welcome, students, to a fascinating topic, the interaction of radiation with matter. Today, we're going to explore how radiation energy can affect atoms within matter. When matter absorbs radiation, it can cause atoms to do two things, become excited or become ionized. Now, pay close attention to this part because it's crucial. Radiation that causes ionization, aptly named, ionizing radiation is significantly more harmful to biological systems compared to radiation that doesn't cause ionization, which we call, non-ionizing radiation. Non-ionizing radiation generally has lower energy levels. Think of examples like radio frequency electromagnetic radiation or slow-moving neutrons. So, in essence, the type of radiation matters a lot when it comes to its impact on living organisms. Ionizing radiation is something we need to be cautious about, and in our next topics, We'll delve even deeper into the effects and applications of these different types of radiation. Welcome, students. Good day, students. Today, we're delving into the fascinating world of ionizing radiation, and its interactions with water, 
in living tissue. It's a topic of great importance, especially in fields like medicine and nuclear science. Let's begin by understanding a crucial fact. Most living tissue is predominantly composed of water, making up at least 70% of its mass. When we irradiate this tissue, something interesting happens. The water molecules within it absorb a significant portion of the radiation's energy. Now, this brings us to the definition of ionizing radiation. We call radiation ionizing when it has the capability to ionize water. But what exactly does that mean? Ionization is a process where atoms or molecules gain or lose electrons, turning them into ions. In the case of water, it takes a minimum energy of 1216 kilojoules per mole to ionize it. And guess what? Alpha, beta, and gamma rays, along with X-rays and higher energy ultraviolet radiation, possess energies exceeding this threshold. That's why they are considered forms of ionizing radiation. So, buckle up, because we're about to dive deeper into the world of these powerful rays, and their impact on living tissues. Good day, student. Let's zoom in on one of our ionizing radiation types, alpha particles. These little powerhouses are actually helium nuclei, consisting of two protons and two neutrons. What's unique about them is their positive charge, which makes them highly effective at ionizing atoms and molecules they encounter. You see, alpha particles have significant mass and a double positive charge, which means they can interact quite strongly with other particles. This high ionization potential makes them formidable. They're often emitted by heavy radioactive elements as part of their decay process. As we explore further, you'll understand just how alpha particles impact living tissues. Let's zoom in on one of Now, let's shift our focus to beta particles, which are essentially high-energy electrons or positrons. Electrons bear a negative charge, while positrons are positively charged. Compared to alpha particles, beta particles have much smaller mass, and this affects their ionization potential. They don't interact as strongly as alpha particles, but they still pack a punch. Beta radiation often originates from a process known as beta decay, which we'll explore further in upcoming topics. Understanding these particles and their effects on living tissue is essential, so stay with me. Now, let's... Hello, students. Today, we're delving into a fascinating topic, the interaction between ionizing radiation and living tissue. When ionizing radiation passes through living tissue, it has a profound effect. One significant result is the removal of electrons from water molecules, which leads to the formation of highly reactive he -O ions. Now, these ions don't just sit idle. They can react with other water molecules in a remarkable way. When an he -O ion encounters another water molecule, it can give rise to an he 3 o ion and a neutral o -He molecule. This chemical transformation is a crucial process with implications in various fields, including radiation therapy and radiation safety. So, buckle up, because we're about to explore the intricacies of this ionization process further. Hello, student. Good day, students. Today, we're delving into the intriguing topic of radiation damage. Our understanding of this topic hinges on several key factors, including the activity and energy of radiation the duration of exposure, and where the radiation source is located. Let's start by exploring the different types of radiation and their effects. Good day, student. Now, let's focus on gamma rays. These rays are particularly formidable when they're outside the body. They can easily penetrate human tissue, much like X-rays. What makes them especially concerning is that their damage isn't limited to just the skin. They can affect tissues deep within the body. Let's move on and see how alpha and beta rays compare. Now, let's focus. Welcome, students. Today, we're delving into the impact of radiation on our body's tissues. It turns out that tissues that reproduce rapidly, like bone marrow, blood-forming tissues, and lymph nodes, are particularly vulnerable to radiation. The primary consequence of extended exposure to low doses of radiation is the development of cancer. Now, let's dig deeper into how radiation affects our cells and why it leads to this serious condition. Welcome, students. Alright, class, let's explore how radiation can actually lead to cancer. It all comes down to the damage caused to the growth regulation mechanism within our cells. 
This damage tricks our cells into reproducing uncontrollably, which is a hallmark of cancer. Now, let's take a closer look at a specific type of radiation caused cancer. All right, clap. Today, we're focusing on a major type of radiation caused cancer, leukemia. This condition is characterized by excessive growth of white blood cells. As you can imagine, this overproduction can have significant health consequences. Let's explore the link between radiation exposure and the development of leukemia. Today, we're before we conclude, it's crucial to understand how we can protect ourselves from radiation's harmful effects. Whether you work in radiology, the nuclear industry, or are concerned about exposure in your daily life, safety measures are essential. We'll discuss ways to reduce radiation exposure and the importance of regular medical checkups to catch any potential issues early. Stay tuned for some valuable insights. Before we conclude, as we wrap up today's lesson, Let's recap what we've learned about the effects of radiation on our body. Rapidly reproducing tissues like bone marrow and lymph nodes are most vulnerable. And extended exposure to low doses can lead to cancer by disrupting cell growth regulation. We specifically explored radiation-induced leukemia as a major concern. Remember, protecting yourself from radiation is essential. And regular checkups can help catch any issues early. Thank you for joining me in this exploration of radiation's impact on our health. As we wrap up today, good day, students. Today, we're delving into the important topic of radiation doses and how we measure them. In the world of radiation, we commonly use two units for measurement. Our first unit is the gray, abbreviated as gray. It's the standard unit for absorbed dose and is part of the International System of Units, C. The gray measures the absorption of one joule of energy per kilogram of matter. Think of it as a way to quantify how much radiation energy is absorbed by a given mass. Now, let's explore this further and understand the significance of radiation doses in various contexts. Good day, students. Hello, students. Today, we're delving into the world of radiation and an essential concept known as relative biological effectiveness, or RBE for short. Now, not all types of radiation affect biological materials in the same way even when they're exposed to the same amount of radiation. Take, for instance, alpha radiation and beta radiation. One radian of alpha radiation can actually cause more damage than one radian of beta radiation. But how do we account for these variations? That's where RBE comes into play. Hello, students. Let's break it down. RBE, or relative biological effectiveness, is a crucial concept in radiation science. It's a measure that helps us understand and quantify the relative damage caused by different types of radiation. Essentially, it corrects for the fact that not all radiation is equally harmful, even when they have the same dose in terms of rads. Let's break it down. Now, let's get specific about RBE values for common types of radiation. For gamma and beta radiation, the RBE is approximately 1. This means that, in terms of biological harm, they are somewhat similar. However, when it comes to alpha radiation, the RBE skyrockets to 10. In other words, alpha radiation is significantly more biologically effective, meaning it can cause much more damage to biological materials compared to gamma and beta radiation. Now, let's get... Why is understanding RBE so important, you might wonder? Well, it plays a pivotal role in radiation safety. By knowing the relative biological effectiveness of different types of radiation, we can better assess and manage the risks associated with radiation exposure. This knowledge is crucial in ensuring the safety of workers and the general public when dealing with radiation sources. Why is understanding? As we conclude our discussion on RBE, remember that it's a critical concept in the world of radiation. It helps us correct for differences in the damage caused by various types of radiation. Alpha radiation, with an RBE of 10, is particularly potent, while gamma and beta radiation have an RBE of about 1. This knowledge is vital for ensuring the safety of those who work with radiation and for managing radiation-related risks effectively. Thank you for joining me today in exploring this important aspect of radiation science. As we conclude our